Meeting to order. I'm Councilmember Weezer. We've been joined by Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, Councilmember Cedillo, and Councilmember Englander. We will first take up the multiple agenda item comments. Those are for people who've signed up to speak on more than one item. We have no cards. Uh, we also been joined by Council Member Price. So we will go directly to the consent calendar. On the consent calendar, item number two, we will uh, have a new time limit of 45 days that will be continued to May 26. Without objection, item number five, we will um, extend the time limit to act to July 28th, and we will reconsider the item on April 25th for item five. Without objection, Item number one is the report from the Director of Planning, Mr. Vince Bartoni. Mr. Bartoni's not here today. No items, nothing to report, so we will receive and file item number one. I'm sorry, shoot. I did not, uh, there's a card on two, which is the applicant rep, Mr. Resnick. You here? No, those are continued items. Yeah, the continued items, you okay? Okay. Item five is uh, extend the time limit to act to July 28th, but we will agendize it for April 20, April 25th. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we could move to item number three and four and take those items up together, please, and have a presentation by, from staff. So item three, Councilman, this is a planning commission recommended zone change and building line removal. And there's also an appeal file uh, by Charles Johnson for the underlying project. And item uh, four is the track map. And also there's an appeal by Charles Johnson. Okay. Good, af uh, good afternoon, honorable members. This is Nelson Rodriguez, Department of City Planning. Uh, this project uh, went to CPC on October 27th with the recommendation of approval. The track map was appealed at CPC and they denied the, the CPC, um, CPC denied the tract. Um, and then consequently, after Plum Transmittal, uh, the track was appealed for a second time, which is before you uh, today. Um, staff has been made aware that the uh, CD10 along with uh, CD7, the appellants, the community, and the, um, the applicant have been um, working uh, to iron out some of the issues and concerns raised by the appeal, the appellant, and uh, they are, the applicant is here today to, um, to uh, pitch their, uh, their modified project. Uh, which staff is not uh, yet aware of the, of the project, but they are here to uh, um, show you the, the project that they want to modify um, that I think will um, help resolve a lot of the appellant's uh, concerns. Great, thank you. We will now go to public comment. Uh, first, we have a card from Paola Flores. You signed up for item number four. I think you signed up for item six instead? Or the election. The election, yeah, item six. Oh, sorry. I said four there, okay. We will put that card in six. And now um, the applicant, Scott Smith, or Scott something. So I'll come. Thank you. So you have five minutes on your presentation. Okay, honorable members, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm yes. We usually take up the appellant, but I don't have a card from the appellant. Is there an appellant here? Yes. Did you submit a card, sir? No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. Do I need one? Did he yes. Need one? So let's, we're going to hear first from the appellant, and then we'll go to the applicant. But I understand you're going to propose some changes to the project? 
or somebody Sorry. is? Yeah, to, okay. to ask for a continuance to April 25th and to propose some changes that we've worked out with the community. Okay. Why don't you, um, let's do this. Let's hear from the applicant, and then we'll hear from the appellant. You, sir, and in the meantime, if you could fill out a card okay. with the, the clerk, and we would love to hear what your proposed changes are today, if you are proposing changes, so that the planning team can evaluate those should we continue this item. <clears throat> you have a total of five minutes. Pass these around. Anyway, m members of the council, our committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, Scott Smith and myself, Scott Willette, we're here representing Williams Holmes, the uh, project applicant. Um, and we're here to ask for a continuance to April 25th. Based upon the community's input, we made some revisions to the project. During the continued period, it's our goal to work with planning to finalize the conditions and findings for ultimate approval of the project. We've made some meaningful concessions um, to get to this point today. Our original plan was approved by the neighborhood council and the council office, but then there was an appeal filed after the advisory agency approval. Um, we made some concessions at planning commission. There was an additional appeal filed after planning commission. So we met with representatives of the community. We've met with the appellant. Um, we met with representatives of the neighborhood council, and what, we're, what is before you today is a, a handshake plan that we've all agreed to. Um, and so it's our goal during the continued period just to, uh, like I said, revise the conditions and, and the findings so that we can get this project approved. In writing? And I'm sorry. Did you submit? Oh, oh, here they are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so base, it, the basic change to the project is um, in responding to a request from the community, we've kept the density of the project um, within its existing zoning on the parcel that fronts Sepulveda Boulevard. And we've reduced the density on the balance of the project on the back half of the Sepulveda parcel and on the plumber parcel. So it's the project is still the same number of units Thank you. Charles Johnson? The appellant? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've agreed to this. If they, if they want an extension and you approve it, we've agreed to it. We've, everything is, we, we had a meeting last week and uh, ironed out most of the problems that we had and there's only um, I think they want to put it to paperwork and get see how much they can do I'm not sure exactly why they need the extension but uh, as far as we're concerned that's fine with us Great. thank you mm -hmm. thank you well thank you I, I think we should uh, grant the extension uh, given the changes in the project to allow the planning department to review the changes and see that we may need some new uh, conditions of approval we may need some other na analysis my one question is um, would this require the new scope require an MND will we look at that or just is it just the conditions of approval that we need to look at uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilman Lisa Weber with the Planning Department. Um, we have taken a preliminary look at this project, and given that it is the same density as the original project, uh, we believe that the uh, CEQA analysis uh, conducted to date will be sufficient. However, we will be doing additional supplemental work uh, to um, make the appropriate CEQA findings in support of this alternative project. Yep. Okay, thank you. And I omitted another card. I didn't see this card till now. Andrew Westall from Council District 10. They're the uh, overseeing Council District 7 at this time. So you're fine? Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, let's do this then. Let us uh, request that we reconsider this item on April 25th. 
and uh, have the planning department review the proposed changes and come back at that time with a recommendation from the planning department. Thank you. Any objections to that? Seeing none, so ordered. Okay, now we will go to item six. Item six, Councilman, this is a central APC uh, report. It includes two appeals relative to a mixed-use project in CD14. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jenna Monterosa with the Planning Department. And again, what is before you is the CEQA appeal for a project located at 850 South Hill, namely the Alexan project. This project has been granted a director's level determination for a transfer of floor area rights and site plan review for a mixed use project containing up to 305 residential units, 6,171 square feet of ground floor commercial, with the floor area ratio totaling up to 7.145 to 1 and a maximum height of 320 feet or 27 stories. No variances, adjustments, or any other forms of relief from the municipal code have been requested or granted. The subject approval is located downtown within the Central City Community Plan. The property is a vacant lot and is zoned C5-4D and is located at the northeast corner of 9th and Hill Streets. It is located immediately south of the Broadway Trade Center building and west of the Eastern Columbia building. In conjunction with the requested entitlements, an addendum to a previously adopted mitigated negative declaration was prepared for the project. In 2007, a mitigated negative declaration was adopted in conjunction with the approval of a mixed-use project on the subject site which contained up to 158 residential units and 5,700 square feet of ground floor commercial space. An addendum to the, pre to the prepared, now modified project has updated the analysis of this environmental review and analyzed the environmental impacts that would be caused by the project. The addendum drew the same conclusion that all identified environmental impacts would be mitigated to less than significant levels. The prepared addendum was not published for formal comment as it is not required by CEQA However, it was published on the city's website for approximately 30 days prior to the hearing officer hearing, which took place May 25th of 2016. A uh, formal response to the appeals that have been submitted to this, uh, against this project have been submitted to the council file, and so my intent today is to go over some of the main uh, appeal points and um, provide some brief responses. So one of the first appeal points raised was with regards to the CRA's involvement with the environmental review of the project. The appeal point says that specifically the CRA's designated local authority is required to act as a lead agency under CEQA. Planning maintains that while the procedures under site plan review state that the CRA shall be the lead agency for required environmental review of projects in CRA areas, the CRA as defined by the municipal code has been dissolved. Following the dissolution, the Department of City Planning has assumed the role as, as the lead agency for review of discretionary projects in designated CRA areas. The Department of Cities Planning practice is further supported by CEQA guidelines section 15051, which states that where two or more public agencies will be involved with a project, the lead agency shall be the agency with the greatest responsibility for supervising or approving the project as a whole. Even in the event where more than one agency has equal responsibility for approving a project, the agency which uh, will first act on the project in question shall be the lead agency. And finally, where there is still question, the public agencies may by agreement designate an agency as the lead agency. In each of these instances, the Department of City Planning has assumed the role as a lead agency for this project. Another appeal point raised states that this is not a modified project, but a new project, and that an environmental impact report should be prepared. Planning maintains that what is before you is a modified project and that staff has gone through the procedures outlined in CEQA sections uh, 15164 and 15162. 
finding that no new significant impacts have been identified and that the severity of previously identified impacts has not been substantially increased. The addendum did perform a thorough analysis of the environmental impacts of the project. The analysis was supported by the preparation of new studies, which include air quality, modeling worksheets, shade and shadow study, an updated geotechnical report, greenhouse gas emission calculation, a phase one site assessment, a noise study, a traffic study, and finally, a historic assessment, which was prepared by the Historic Resources Group, a consultant, which is a recognized cultural resource consultant for the environmental review. And so, what before you, so with that, you know, we maintain that the addendum is appropriate. One of the main appeal points that you have before you is that this project will create a significant impact on historic resource. Much like the previously approved project, the modified project's location within an urbanized setting will result in a project that will partially block visibility of historic resources. As mentioned, the project is located adjacent to the Broadway Trade Center building and the Eastern Columbia. Planning maintains that the 2016 historic assessment prepared for the addendum analyzed the impacts caused by the modified project to such surrounding resources and found that the modified project, like the previously approved project, will not materially impair the integrity or significance of any resource. The project will not diminish, relocate, rehab rehabilitate, or alter any historic resource or district located on the site or in the vicinity and does not involve construction that reduces the integrity or significance of historic resources in the district in the area. Even with the project's increased height, the modified project incorporates design features including increased setbacks, which would result in less than significant impacts. And when looking specifically at the Eastern Columbia and, uh, building and the Broadway Trade Center building, one, of the, one important fact to note excuse me, is that the facades which face the project were designed in a more plain and utilitarian manner in anticipation of future development occurring at 850 South Hill. The south facade of the Broadway Trade Center and the west um, and the west or north facade of the Eastern Columbia Building were built absent of any balconies or other notable features that were identified as contributing to the historic designations. Furthermore, the visibility of the Eastern Columbia Building's clock tower from a 360 degree angle was not something discussed in its designation. The subject property has been identified as being within the downtown Los Angeles historic core, however it is not within a district and as such will not, uh, will not cut a district in half. The assessment that was prepared found that the modified project would not visually impact the established district and in addition an impact to an established district is not determined by its visibility from adjacent streets, um, as which was occurred with the previous project. The Planning Department's Office of Historic Resources has reviewed a recently submitted assessment that was prepared on behalf of the um, Eastern Columbia Homeowners Association, which was prepared by Charles J. Fisher. In the response to the appeal, it was um, called the Fisher Report. And this report attempts to substantiate the claim that the modified project will have a significant impact on neighboring historic resources. And um, upon review, our planning department's Office of Historic Resources has found that the report presents, does not present oh, sorry, substantial evidence to support its conclusion that a, a significant impact would occur. I can go over other points, but one other thing I do want to mention, which is not specific to a CEQA appeal, but it was raised in the documents that were submitted for the appeal. Uh, the point says that the city does not have the authority to grant a transfer floor area without the approval of a transfer plan. And, um, you know, we maintain that the applicant has requested and been approved for a transfer floor area of less than 50,000 square feet pursuant to LAMC section 14.5.7 in exchange for a payment to the public benefit trust fund. A transfer plan is only required for transfers of floor area of 50,000 or more pursuant to LIMC section 14.5.6 and is not a requirement pursuant to the requested entitlement that has been requested by the uh, election project. With that, as the applicant has failed to adequately disclose how the city has erred in its actions relatively to, relative to the MND addendum, planning staff respectfully recommends that the appeal of ENV 2006-6302-MND-REC1 be denied. And I'm here available for any questions you may have. 
Thank you. We will now hear from the uh, appellant. There are two, two appeals, right? So appellant number one is Alex Hertzberg and Daniel Wright. Mr. Wright, you have a total of five minutes, and do you want to share these with your client, or do you wish to uh, do five and one? Uh, I believe I'll be um, trying to present within the time limit that you've given. Okay. Thank you. Daniel Wright of the Silverstein Law Firm, on behalf of the Society for Preservation of Downtown Los Angeles, let the record reflect that as a result of our further investigation of the issues of this appeal, we filed under today's date an additional uh, in addition to our appeal materials and the letter of uh, February 28th, a 14-page letter and four exhibits which has been submitted and accepted by the clerk. The City Planning Department has failed to comply with mandatory duties in the CEQA statute and in the City's own Municipal Code, Section 1605G, relating to environmental appeal. As a preliminary matter, land use appellant uh, SPDTLA includes but is not limited to its members um, are property owners immediately adjacent to the project and they are entitled to a fair hearing today, particularly where the issues in the case involve the determination of facts as applied to a single project, which is a quasi-adjudicatory function of the City Council sitting as an appellate body under CEQA. We are informed and believe that this appeal and project were discussed at a meeting of planning deputies of members of the Plum Committee um, regarding a, at a thing called the city's use of a plum pre-meeting which was not open to the public and followed up with briefing of the plum committee members through their intermediaries who attended this pre-plum meeting. This is an ex parte communication and possible violations of the Brown Act as a serial meeting, particularly if the decision was made outside of today's meeting as to how to handle this appeal at the pre-plum meeting. Thus, this proceeding may be fundamentally unfair to appellant and its property owner members. We also object to the five minutes provided as particularly uh, inadequate for a discussion of the complex appeal issues um, involved in this case. On the merits, LAMC section 1605G imposes a duty upon the city to refer any application for site plan review that's located within a redevelopment project area to the CRALA to act as lead agency for CEQA review. Um, there's been this contention by the staff that the entity no longer exists, but by state law, there is a designated successor agency and they assume the responsibilities under the city's code, so that contention of staff is meritless. As conceded in the planning recommendation report at page 11, and by the developer's own uh, February 22nd letter, they have not followed this procedure. Um, and the staff just admitted on the record that the city assumed the CRA's function, which is an admission of a violation of the municipal code. The developer cites a proposed ordinance that's been rejected twice by the city, and as everyone knows, if it's not been enacted into law, it's not the law. The CRA was required to act as the lead agency under this section and, the, and was mandated to do so, especially since the transfer of floor area ordinance mandates that only the CRA can grant an increase of less than 50,000 square feet of area in a redevelopment plan area, which is, um, which the planning director purported to also do in violation of the code. In other words, the city usurped the CRA's role as the agency still administering the land use duties of the um, former redevelopment agency. Without waiving these fundamental jurisdictional flaws, this project is being approved using a 2007 MND for a different project, significantly taller and more dense than the abandoned 2007 project. The Fisher report that's referenced by your staff is substantial evidence in the record that there will be significant impacts on historic resources because the methodology used by HRG in their report that's been relied upon by the city um, is um, deficient. For all of these reasons, we uh, enter our objections and renew our objection that five minutes is not an adequate time to really explain these issues to council members, particularly when there's nothing on this record showing that council members have personally read the materials uh, involved in our appeal. Thank you. Oh, 
I'm sorry, I thought I only had three seconds left. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll continue. Um, with regard to the, the historic resources issue, this building is surrounded on, five si on all sides by five major historic resources. And the analysis provided by HRG um, with respect to the impacts uh, on adjacency, which is a, an esoteric, well, kind of a esoteric and difficult issue, has been an evolving issue in which there are new standards that are being followed by um, under the Secretary of Interior standards, and those standards were not used as outlined in the Fisher report. Um, and that is a principal reason and a significant reason why the historic analysis is inadequate. And so for all of those reasons and our continuing objection about due process, um, we um, ask that th this be sent back for proper consideration as a new project. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Swanson. Hello, my name is Sheila Swanson. I'm a member of the Eastern Columbia Board of Directors as well as a homeowner uh, since 2007 when the building opened. Um, I would uh, like to draw the council's attention to the fact that uh, despite plannings and the developer's assertion, this is not a modified project. If a single individual residential owner came to you with a proposal to build a two-story home and then came back and wanted to build a four-story home, you would require an entirely new study. This building is seven stories higher and accommodates over 150 people more than the original building. That is the subject of the MND. What we're asking for is a proper treatment of this building as a new project with a full EIR and new MND. That's a very simple thing that the, both the developer and the city should both be expected to fulfill. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Lederman for the applicant. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Lederman from Liner. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. And I do wanna uh, give a big thank you to staff. It's been a long process over here and they've been extremely diligent with all their efforts with regard to the project and processing this and dealing with a lot of controversy. So I really do appreciate that. Um, with regard to uh, uh, Mr. Wright's uh, points, um, uh, site plan review, um, CRA doesn't exist anymore, as it's defined in the LA Municipal Code. And in the record, you have correspondence from uh, the successor agency to the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles indicating that planning should act first. And if planning is going to act first on the actions, it must be the lead agency under the law. So rightfully so, the city acted as the lead agency. With respect to Mr. Wright's comments about TFAR, that is not at issue here. It is completely irrelevant to this appeal, which is solely about CEQA. Um, to, uh, to just for informational purposes, um, the municipal code does require TFAR. The city has to take actions as well as the CRA. And with CRA's correspondence indicating that planning should act first, the city has followed the rules diligently and there would be a subsequent approval that would be necessary from CRA as well. Um, and with regard to the age of the 2007 MND, uh, Mr. Wright's correspondence uh, includes uh, 1974 EIR uh, and saying that uh, the city should follow this 1974 EIR. Um, so I find it hard to believe why the 2006-2007 MND is not appropriate here. In this circumstance, the city has determined that it is relevant for analyzing the environmental impact as such. Um, it is appropriate to use an addendum to that uh, MND. Um, we also have uh, Paul Travis, who's over here. If I could um, bring him up to respond to some of the comments about um, the historic standards, I'd just like him to briefly address that. Uh, good afternoon, council people. Paul Travis, Historic Resources Group. So uh, very briefly, uh, in reference to new standards that have been presented in terms of evaluating impacts to historic resources under CEQA, 
um, it's our contention that it is CEQA and the CEQA thresholds for significant impact to a historic resource that are the only relevant ones here. Um, the Secretary of the Interior standards are standards that have been put forth by the Park Service to aid and guide uh, rehabilitation of historic resources. But we're not dealing with a historic resource here. It is not in a district. The, the site is not a historic resource. We do, um, so really, it really is just that threshold under CEQA as to what constitutes a significant impact. And under CEQA, you have to have material impairment of the resource such that its ability to convey its historic significance would no longer, would, would be impaired in some way, and that's not the case here. So again, thank you. Great. If you have any questions, we have uh, the, full, <laughs> the full roster of experts, architects, traffic consultants, so um, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, now for the remainder of the public comment, it's one, min one minute each. Dan Goldberg, Patricia Sarnbetz, Justin Riley, Geraldyn Krajek, Krajek. Okay, my name is Don Goldberg. Before the council, before this committee votes to advance this project, the public to have confidence is entitled to know whether the developers, the landowner, or their associates have provided money or other consideration to the council members, their campaigns, their projects or businesses, or those of their family members. Can each of the council members provide a written report with this information? I'll use the rest of my minute waiting for a response. Yes, sir, we usually don't allow for a back and forth here unless one of the, somebody wants to um, do that, but we don't, it's not a conversation, it's a public comment period. Okay, let the record show that the council is unwilling and unable to respond to this request that, that underlines the integrity of any decision that's made by the committee or by the council. Mr. Englander? Yeah, I'd be happy to make a comment on that, actually. Um, Unfortunately, under the rules uh, and the way that it's structured under the procedures of these committee meetings, council meetings, et cetera, we're prohibited, even if we wanted to, have a dialogue and a conversation under public comment rules. Um, so we can listen, but we can't comment on or have a dialogue with uh, anybody filling out a card for public comment. I, for one, would be honored and happy to change that rule under the law, but it is a law, so it's frustrating as much on that side of the podium as it is on this one. But appreciate also, all uh, comments are taken into consideration. Appreciate it being here. Ms. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I appreciate Mr. Englander's uh, comments because it is very, very difficult to have earnest, uh, legitimate questions come and not be able to respond to them. I, I would note for the record that all uh, donations are a matter of public record. Uh, at the Los Angeles City Ethics uh, website, you can find every member, everybody that they've taken donations from. Patricia Serenbeths, I reside at 849 South Broadway in the Historic Core. By seeing historic buildings, both tourists and Angelinos are able to witness the aesthetic and cultural history of an area, that being Los Angeles. The Alexan project bears no resemblance to the Historic Core and is visually incompatible. The preservation of historic buildings is a one-way street. There's no chance to restore or save a historic site once it is gone. Regret also goes one way. Once the historic core is destroyed, it is gone forever. This has happened in many cities. I have witnessed the cities of Aleppo, Palmyra, Timbuktu before their destruction. Gone forever is their historic core. So I would please ask that this indiscriminate development not occur. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for hearing us today. My name is Justin Riley. I'm a stakeholder of downtown for over 10 years. Um, Proposition S did not pass 
but it did bring to light a lot of the issues across the city that a lot of community members are really fed up with. Developers making private deals with city planning, out of scale projects and zoning, and definitely other city codes that need to be addressed. Since then, our mayor, Garcetti, has brought that he's banned private meetings between the developers and city commissioners. And what you have in front of you right now is a franchise development, a, a development that was approved previously under this corrupt process. So you have the opportunity today to send it back and restart this process and make it more transparent for all the community members and city planning. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine, Joanne, Dan Ganan. Yuri Huxley, Irene Boyd. Welcome. Hello, my name is Geraldine Krajak. I'm a downtown stakeholder and I've lived downtown in the historic core for over 10 years and I've been very involved in uh, the bringing back Broadway projects and bringing um, economic development into, into downtown and other areas of Los Angeles. So we've been big boosters for the growth of the area. Um, but I just sort of shocked that you're allowing a project like this to be built right behind the Eastern Columbia and surrounded by four or five other historic buildings when there's so many other design options that would be available, including the original plan. So I want to express my extreme disappointment and opposition to the project as it's proposed. It's a multi-level glass story building that has nothing to do with the historic architecture. It lacks creative design. It, it offers no substantial benefit to the neighborhood. Um, and once the 10 years from now, the developer is going to be gone and it's going to be just another glass block building that is not, is not adding to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Dengannon with Central City Association, or CCA. CCA continues to be a strong advocate for downtown as the region's center for growth, so we support the development at 850 Health Street, known as the Alexan. The Alexan will transform a surface parking lot into a high-rise with almost 7,000 square feet of retail and restaurant space and 305 residential units. It will therefore activate the street, provide pedestrian-friendly walkways, and open public space for community use. Supporting the election and projects like it will ensure that downtown remains a thriving center of 24-7 activity, bustling with new residents, cultural attractions, and a diverse job base. Thank you, for, thank you committee, for this consideration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yuri Huxley. I'm a nearby resident of uh, the proposed site, uh, and I oppose the project um, as proposed by the developer. Um, I feel that the alleged conditions imposed uh, by the director are inadequate to protect the legitimate rights and interests of the surrounding historic properties. I don't understand why um, an environmental impact report or a brand new MMD, MND is not required of this project. Um, I think we can all agree that that is a good thing. Uh, information that can only benefit the area, the project, the residents, the businesses. And when there is so much opposition and concern as to why this EIR or MND is, uh, is not being uh, uh, put on the table as a, and considered as a brand new um, project, I think there's something wrong there. And I think that the city should highly reconsider. Green Boyd, Kate yeah. Gailey, Josh Albertson, Godfrey Wachira. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Irene Boyd. I live in Hi, Mitch. I live in Sherwood Forest, right in Mitch's um, wonderful locale. He does a wonderful job for us. Um, honorable committee members. I understand that one of the major purposes of CEQA is for the protection of historic resources. And at a recent public meeting of the DTLA Community Plan Revision, which I attended, I was told specifically that the historic core, or the traditional core, if you will, contains a rich collection of historically significant buildings and that protection, restoration, and reuse of these structures is a priority. And that another priority is maintaining neighborhood character and sense of place. 
It is undeniable that the developer does not have an automatic right to build the proposed complex. That means that automatically it is requesting special permission to violate existing building standards that exist precisely to protect those priorities that I just spoke of. So why is a developer or any developer to be given special permission or dispensation to violate existing building requirements without full environmental review? Thank you for your time. My name is Katie Galley. I'm a resident and a business owner in downtown Los Angeles for the last 10 years. I'm sorry to be standing here today, but the process to date has been a failure. It's put the short-term gain of developers against ahead of the long-term benefits of Los Angeles and its residents. Downtown Los Angeles has only one historic core, and this site is squarely in its center and surrounded by historic buildings. The proposed development is not compatible with the, your very own guidelines for the historic core. The original design approved would have been much more respectful. Instead, under the guise that this is a modified project, this has swept through the process in a way of ease that probably wouldn't have happened with the mayor's recent pronounced guidelines. Council members, I know you care about the historic core and bringing back Broadway. This project would be akin to building an ugly drab high rise across one side of Big Ben. Please don't allow Los Angeles to be as crass as the rest of the world suspects. Please don't let this happen on your watch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Godfrey Washira with Creed LA and we oppose the appeal. Uh, Creed LA's position is simple. The appellants simply do not provide substantial evidence to show how the project's changes cause environmental impacts. In fact, as I was reading through the appeal, it reminded me of a scene in the TV show, The People versus O.J. Simpson. Throw as many theories out there and hope that one sticks. Well, without substantial evidence, none sticks. The, the staff report really shows there's no point that sticks. And the, ap the applicant's lawyers also do provide evidence to show that there's no substantial evidence that has been brought to the record to show that these changes will cause any significant impacts. And that's why we urge the, the committee to uh, reject the appeal and allow the project to move forward. As you can see, the men and women who are ready to build the project are here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Josh Albrechtson, Jose Pina, Yolita Dines, uh, Aisia Flowers. Hi, my name is Josh Abrexen. I am the elected area-wide representative for the Downtown Neighborhood Council. I speak for myself today, not for them. During this um, long process, there are many hearings. The Downtown Neighborhood Council approved this project unanimously with two abstentions. The Downtown News published an editorial saying this building should be built. The community as a whole strongly supports this building. We do not consider a parking lot on the corner of Ninth and Hill to be historic in any way, shape, or form. And when they talk about being surrounded by five historic buildings, one of those is a historic parking lot. If you walk around there, you will see that there is a 32-story brand new building, level DTLA, a 50-story building being built right now that is closer to the Alexan than the Eastern Columbia is to the Alexan. And also, if you walk the streets, you will see there are 200 square feet from the sidewalk where you could see that clock face. That clock face has already been blocked by every other building. That's it. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jose Pina and I'm here with Creed LA and we oppose the appeal. The appellant claims that an addendum cannot be uh, used because this is a new and not a modified project. But we urge the committee to consider the Supreme Court's ruling in the San Mateo Gardens case. In this case, the court rejected the new project case and deferred to agencies on whether project modifications require subsequent environmental review. The court made it clear that an agency's decision to proceed with an addendum is reviewable under the differential substantial evidence standard of review. In regards to the election, the city determined that an addendum is sufficient and that the appellant has not provided substantial evidence to show that this decision is improper. We therefore urge the committee to reject the appeal and find that no subsequent EIR or MND is required. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Yolita Dines. I'm here with Creed LA, and we urge the committee to reject the appeal. As my colleague just mentioned, the San Mateo ruling undermines the appeal's modified project argument. The court also backed the Manny Brothers ruling. In this ruling, project changes are meaningful only to the extent they affect a project's environmental impacts. In this case, the appeal fails to pass the fair argument standard, let alone substantial evidence to review the modified product, project will cause new or substantially more se severe significant environmental impacts. For these reasons, we believe the committee should deny the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. I, Jeff Flowers, ja, Jamila Bradford, Rick Garcia, Gus Torres, and Shamari Davis. Good afternoon. My name is Asia Flowers, and I'm here on behalf of Creed LA. One of the reasons for opposition of this project is, the, is blocking of the western side of the clock of the Eastern Columbia building. That may have been true a few years ago, but not today. Other developments in the area have already blocked the view of the clock, yet its significance as a visual historic resource is not impaired. Trying to stop the Alexum project on the grounds of blocking the clock simply does not apply anymore. Please reject the appeal. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jamile Bradford on behalf of Creed LA. We support the Alexian project. We believe that the long-term interests of this city should be taken priority over the interests of the small segment of the community. The Alexian will be benefit, benefit the community from the construction jobs created to revitalize the economy and support local businesses. These are valuable social benefits that need to be cherished, protected, and approved by the community. We urge you to reject this appeal and say yes to economic growth for our city. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Garcia, and I am here representing Sheet Metal Workers Local 105. We at Local 105 truly hope that the appeal will be rejected so that the transformation and revitalization of downtown LA can continue. Housing stock can be increased. Small businesses can tap into large consumer base good paying jobs can be created. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Gus Torres. I'm here on behalf of UA Local 250 pipe fitters, welders, refrigeration techs, and apprentices. We're 4,900 strong, and with my colleagues behind me, 709 sprinkler pipe fitters, and all the building trades. We're 100% in support of this project, Let's not put the brakes on the kind of progress that increases housing density in downtown, creates jobs, justifies billions of dollars being invested in mass transit. We urge the commission to reject the appeal and reaffirm the, the city's long-term commitments to provide more housing and create good paying jobs. Thank you very much and God bless. Shamari Davis, Chris Cheek, Roy Apusia, Nick Griffin. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Shamari Davis. I'm a business rep with IBW Local 11, an electrician's union, representing about 12,000 workers. Uh, here and my colleagues are here. We're in support of the project. Um, we ask something simple, a uh, simple request to the commission. You have in front of you a project that meets Mayor Garcetti's goal of 100,000 new housing units and embraces Councilman Weezar's call for more high-rise density in downtown and it takes advantage of local transit investments. This is the kind of smart development that we should embrace and not oppose. So therefore, we respectfully urge you to deny the appeal. Thank you so much for your consideration. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cheek. I'm here on behalf of Plumbers Local 78 in Los Angeles. We are strongly in support of the election. The project will bring good local jobs to the city and support area wage standards. This project will put our local people to work and will be an asset to the city. We hope that the commission will take this opportunity to support our local workforce by rejecting the appeal. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Roy Alfosia. I'm here to represent the Sprinkler Federal Local 709. We stand here strong, support the election project, and that will bring thousands of good paying jobs for hardworking men and women in LA. 
We commend the developer for committing the area wage standard, standards that will allow those who work on the project to provide for their families health care and build our local economy. On behalf of Sprinkler Fitters Local 709, we support this project and urge you to reject repeal. Thank you for your time and your commitment. Thank you, Nick Griffin, Paola Flores. Nick Lepp, Paola Flores. Good afternoon, council members and committee members. My name is Paola Flores. I work for the Historic Core Business Improvement District. I am here today on behalf of the bid to fully support the election. Our board voted to approve a letter of support for this project because we firmly believe the election will bring much needed housing, not only to downtown LA, but to the city of Los Angeles. Moreover, Building density around public transport stops is simply smart planning. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last card for our public comments. Is, uh, can planning staff please come back up? I didn't get my one minute. I am oh, the okay. appellant, if that's okay. Sure, go right in. Thank you. Uh, you can state, Al restate your name, please. Alex Hertzberg for the Society of Preservation of Downtown Los Angeles. Okay. Esteemed council, thank you very much for your time and consideration. I'd like to point out just a couple quick <clears throat> points. Number one, we support the entitled project uh, and we hope uh, we have the opportunity to support it further when we have the when someone has the opportunity to build it. The good union gentleman we just saw will have that opportunity to build that building and I defy any of them to speak to the differences between the <clears throat> previous entitled project and the current one. Um, just a couple quick uh, misnomers. There is no luxury housing crisis in the city of Los Angeles. There is no affordable housing component to the proposed project and this ultimately is the issue. Angelinos need uh, inventory that they can afford. This does nothing to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we could have staff come back up, please, for some questions. If I may, Jenna Monteras, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things said. Uh, first thing, we just wanted to maintain the appropriateness as a lead agency pursuant to CEQA. Uh, the other thing we wanted to say was that an addendum is appropriate. The time where an addendum would not be appropriate is if a new significant impact or substantial increase in the severity of previously identified impacts were identified, which is not the case when the impacts of the um, election project were analyzed. If a full environmental analysis was prepared and the historic report that was prepared um, would have been the same report that would be done for a new initial study. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that we have Ken Bernstein here as our head of our Office of Historic Resources. So if you have specific questions with regards to historic impacts, he's available um, in addition to myself. And um, I think that's pretty much it. So I'm here for any other questions. Thank you. And just to be clear and, and answer it very concisely and clearly, sure. why wasn't a new EIR completed for this after the new project was proposed? Well, CEQA basically outlines that a, an addendum should be prepared if there was a previous environmental analysis done on a project site and none of the identified um, uh, instances under CEQA guidelines section 15162 um, apply. And so that exercise was prepared, used as a baseline, but all studies were updated. So the addendum that was done to the MND? Correct. That covered any additional environmental impacts that would be reviewed even if a... Correct. The way the addendum, the addendum looks and feels just like an initial study does, um, what it does is identify the previous project and then says the impacts that were related to that project. It then goes into a detailed analysis of what the changes are with the modified project and then looks at any impacts created by that project. Okay, and one of the appeals uh, said that the impacts to historical resources was incomplete or not enough mitigations were done to, uh, imp uh, to uh, alleviate the impacts on the um, historical resources. Was that analyzed? Yes, that was analyzed. The report that was done identified all of the historic resources in the area, specifically, and specifically look more closely at those that are abutting the project site. And as mentioned by HRG, the, the threshold there really is, will this project create an impact that would potentially remove uh, the project's ability to be, or an, a, a historic cultural monument's ability to be a monument? And so 
although the project is larger, there, the construction of it is not going to now result in the Eastern Columbia not being a historic cultural monument. Okay. So what, what types of mitigations were put in place to alleviate any impacts on the uh, historical resources? Uh, so a couple of mitigation measures that were identified, um, basically there was an analysis done and two identified mitigation measures that were included in there will basically ensure that as project plans get further engineered, which would typically happens during permitting, that any sub subsequent changes will be reviewed by an impartial third party to ensure that the project that may be subsequently changed um, would be in line with what was approved. So it's not, say, it's not kicking the mitigation or the review down the road, it's just ensuring that the project as may be tweaked, which often happens when projects are further engineered for, for permitting, will be maintained uh, below any significant um, uh, impact levels. Yeah. So what's being asked for is a site plan review and a TFAR application. Correct. Right? TFAR application is just allowing it to go a little higher with some community benefits and uh, it's allowed under this area. Um, and the other was site plan, but it got, in, in my view, some pretty extensive community review given those were the only two applications, correct? Would you agree with that? Correct. Okay, and what role did any, the Broadway um, Historic District and the Historic Downtown Design Guidelines play in the city's review with respect to the sequel issues? Well, with res what I can say initially, when a project is requested a TFAR application, one of the findings that needs to be made by uh, planning is that it's meeting the Downtown Design Guidelines. And so one of the things um, specifically that you look for, there's a number of different policies and standards that are required. And so we have to say affirmatively that it's meeting the requirements. And these downtown design guidelines were uh, a full analysis or full set of guidelines that were been adopted by the city. Within those guidelines, there are, downtown, there are historic downtown design guidelines, which were never fully adopted by the city, but they're referenced in the downtown design guidelines. And so for this project, we went through the downtown design guidelines to make sure that it was meeting all those requirements. We did require one change to the project, which did get modified prior to um, any approval, one of which being that no more than three online parking levels uh, could be permitted. So the project was modified, a, a level of subterranean parking was added, and um, some parking levels were lined. Um, and then when looking at the historic guidelines, there really are, uh, they're pretty general. One of the things it does identify in those historic design guidelines is that, you know, when you're doing, looking at infill development, utilize uh, an existing parking lot versus demolishing an existing historic structure. And in those guidelines, it identifies all the existing vacant parking lots that are within downtown. Uh, area. And so looking at those things, and we can go into further details of how the project is meeting um, the intent of those guidelines, but it was determined that the project was meeting all those requirements. Okay, but were there any, so there were modifications given the guidelines, right? That was a, you mentioned there was a subterranean parking, parking level levels. added. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the things that are also noted in the plans, they may be before you, but um, I can name one thing, historic context. The proposed podium of the election has been broken down vertically to maintain a steady rhythm with the adjacent historic buildings, mainly, mainly the Broadway Trade Center. So it, it follows the, the podium of the election, for example, follows the datum line of the historic uh, Broadway Trade Center building. Okay. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? One thing I did want to note, if it would be helpful for you, I did this today, if I may. Just so that it may help guide your review, um, what I'm passing out is, is some street view pictures of the project site, and it'll show you the two buildings that are mainly in question today, and it identifies the Eastern Columbia building. And so as noted in my initial pre um, uh, presentation, the facades which face this site are of a more plain utilitarian manner. The balconies that you see on the Eastern Columbia were added subsequently. The facade was painted. Um, previously was white. And so, you know, these structures were constructed in anticipation of a full build-out of the subject site.
One other thing I did want to mention um, is that one of the main one of the okay uh, one of the thing uh, under the downtown design guidelines it requires that tower spacing be minimally 80 feet from any um, existing or future proposed towers. This project is 80 more than 80 feet away from um, the Eastern Columbia building at the podium level, and at the Alexan's tower level, it's more than 175 feet away from the Eastern Columbia clock tower. And one other thing that these pictures will illustrate is that the uh, turquoise terracotta style, I don't want to get too much into the Eastern Columbia building's historic designation, but one of the things that um, uniquely characterizes the historic building is its tiling facade. And what you can see on these facades which face the subject site is that where it's abutting this project site is uh, that, that terracotta is absent and it's a more stucco plain utilitarian finish. Thank you. So what, what's before us today is just a CEQA review, the environmental review. At the Central Area, at the, yes, the Central Area Planning Commission, they reviewed both the project and the CEQA review? Correct. They, they reviewed both. But Correct. But here at this level of, an, of, of the process, it's only the CEQA appeal that's been made. Now, at the Central Area Planning Commission, did they modify the project at all? There was a couple of conditions that came out of the um, Area Planning Commission's action, one of which was uh, that the project will provide a green wall and or art installation on the podium level um, as it wraps around, uh, as it wraps the Eastern Columbia's utility yard that was added. Another condition that was added uh, was to install downward facing lighting that would not illuminate any adjacent uses, particularly the Eastern Columbia Tower as um, their pool deck is, is facing the subject site. Those are mostly designs, not so much on sequel issues, correct? The correct, issues. correct. Great. Any other questions or comments? Zena? Well, thank you very much. And colleagues, again, this, uh, what's before us today is only the environmental review, the sequel analysis. The project itself is not before us. Uh, it's gone through some analysis and review and Yes, you could say on one hand, um, there are some impacts to what we consider a historic district that has preserved the history of the city. And I think as we move forward, we should be concerned about uh, how uh, the footprint of this uh, historic neighborhood is preserved. At the same time, what's before us and this committee at this time is only the secret review. and. It's my understanding that the modified project was thoroughly considered under CEQA. Um, and I've seen many cases come through here, and this, for the entitlement that was asked for, um, it seems like it's gone through some thorough review and analysis where a number of places throughout the process the CEQA analysis has been made. So with that, I'd like to request that we move to deny the appeals and thereby sustain the entire determination of the Central Area Planning Commission in adopting the MND and addendum. Any objection? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Next item. Uh, well, Councilman, and also you may want to add the mitigation measures um, and the sequel findings. Pardon me? You may want to add the mitigation measures, the mitigation monitoring program, and sequel findings. Okay, we could incorporate that into yes. the motion. Thank you. There, there are no further items, Councilman. There are no uh, public comment cards. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.